Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the topic of intelligent decarbonisation. Uh, my name is Louise and I work at the Cambridge Centre for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore, also known as CARES, which you'll hear more about in a moment. Uh, so please note that today's webinar is being recorded. Um, this webinar is part of the CREATE webinar series. CREATE, or the Campus for Research Excellence in Technological Enterprise, is an international collaboration based in Singapore, which hosts universities from around the world to engage in cutting edge research on a local and global scale. Our work is funded through CREATE by Singapore's National Research Foundation, a department within the Prime Minister's office. I'd like to thank CREATE and the National Research Foundation for their support in running this webinar and our other research activities. In today's webinar, we'll, we will be looking at how intelligent digital technologies can help us to reduce our carbon emissions and mitigate the effects of climate change. Many of the topics that will be discussed today are explored in the upcoming book, Intelligent Decarbonization, written by Professor Marcus Kraft and Professor Oliver Indervildi and published by Springer. We have a fantastic panel of speakers joining us today from industry and academia, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about their research. I'll introduce them properly in a moment. But first, I'd like to hand over to Professor Kraft and Professor Indivildi. Professor Kraft is the Director of CARES and has been based in Singapore, running the centre since 2013. Professor Kraft will give a brief overview of CARES before handing over to Professor Indervildi, who is a visiting fellow at CARES, and he will tell us a bit more about the book. So Marcus, over to you. Thank you, Louise. Hello, everyone. Um, my best wishes from Berlin. This is where I am at the moment. Right, okay. So decarbonization, um, Singapore, how does that all fit together? Um, you see here the Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Sien Long, and um, he, like many other political leaders, um, has realized that uh, um, global warming and the use of fossil fuels will have and are having uh, a very negative impact on our environment. And as a consequence, Singapore supports uh, the agreement uh, that has been formed in Paris to mitigate um, steps. Next slide. And one of the reasons um, why we exist was that um, Singapore is interested in this topic. So the University of Cambridge joined CREATE, um, as Louise just said, in 2013. And so a CREATE entity like the University of Cambridge works very closely with the local universities, in this case, Nanyang Technological University and the National University of Singapore and some others to work on a variety of topics. Next slide, please. But one of the key topics and the topic to start was um, the Cambridge Center for Carbon Reduction Chemical Technology. And here, um, we try to investigate and develop technologies and techniques for the reduction of the carbon footprint of chemical industrial parks, so, such as Jurong Island in Singapore. Um, and many of you may not realize that um, Jurong Island and Singapore is hosting a whole variety of chemical and refinery um, companies. And of course, they have a massive carbon footprint. So the question is, of course, how can you on the one hand, um, reduce the carbon footprint, but on the other hand, keep the economy going. And this is a real um, a difficult problem. And most of all, it, it's all over connected. Um, and please, next slide. And one of the one of the key things that we've been developing in that um, project is the World Avatar Project. It's basically a universal digital twin. So the digital twin of all digital twins, it's dynamic knowledge graph technology. And you see just a, a picture of, of an enormous network that constantly changes. And this work, um, amongst others, triggered Oliver and myself to um, see 
what are the very good contributions are going on around the world, how do industry leaders and and um, and, and and other institutions um, face this problem and um, what can we do about it in future? So with that, I would like to pass on to Oliver um, to talk about um, the, the, the content of um, the book. Many thanks, Marcus, for the introduction. Uh, very good morning from me to everyone in Europe and a good afternoon to everyone in Asia, Australia and New Zealand. I'm going to kick off by talking about two existential risks that humanity is facing at the moment. Uh, the one, the first one is the already mentioned anthropogenic climate change. Here you can see the, in my opinion, clearest visualization of uh, the issue, the so-called warming stripes by Ed Hawkins from 1850 to nowadays. So blue lines here represent years with below average temperatures while red lines represent years with above average temperatures. And from this graph, going from blue to very red, uh, especially since the turn of the millennia, you can clearly see that we are running into a problem. Uh, in the pre-discussion, we already mentioned uh, recent floodings uh, in Germany, for instance, drought and forest fires in North America that we have seen this year, and more fires in the south of Europe. So we can see that extreme weather events are getting more frequent, and these really pose an existential risk to mankind. Uh, the second uh, and less well-known uh, existential risk is stems from the rapid advances in artificial intelligence. It is meanwhile foreseeable that we will create a super intelligence, a machine super intelligence that is far superior to our own mind. However, we do not know how this super intelligence will view us. Will it be malignant? Uh, how will it interact with us? And what will the consequences be of this? So it's, a, it's another real risk that's not as well known at the moment. Anyone interested in these risks that are posed by artificial intelligence? I can refer to the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, where you find a detailed discussion. However, there are enormous opportunities in this because what uh, can we achieve if we utilize the advances in artificial intelligence to actually help us solve the first existential risk, i.e. the climate crisis. And there has been uh, quite some progress uh, and uh, we can harness this indeed for the good. And we have very specific uh, example energy use for server cooling. This is a graph taken from uh, last year's review. Old DeepMind um, had their very specific deep, deep algorithm, a server cooling for Google servers. And then you can see that over a year, using approximately 80 million training cycles, the deep learning algorithm could reduce energy use uh, by servers by 30%. Yeah? This is obviously not only good for the environment and for energy use, it's also very good for Google's bottom line because they save a lot of money. That's also probably a reason why uh, Google has meanwhile acquired DeepMind. So there's also, there are also enormous economic benefits in this. So this got Marx and myself thinking, uh, if we deploy these sort of optimization algorithms throughout the economy, uh, what can we actually achieve? And could it help us to support the race to net zero emissions and actually uh, avert uh, detrimental climate change? So Marx and I are very smart people, but not that smart. Um, so for this, we came up with Springer Nature to create uh, the compendium uh, Intelligent Decarbonization and cyber physical system help achieve climate mitigation targets. So we worked with quite a few people and uh, we created this book with four distinct sections with not only as news and infographics. The sections are firstly technology, where we talk about the advances not only in artificial intelligence, but also cyber physical systems, distributed ledger technology and smart contracts. 
In the second section, we then uh, look at the impact on different uh, areas of the economy, ranging from the chemical industry to water supply, also to energy provision, to transport and mobility, so that we can see what impact is there at the moment and what impact will there be in the foreseeable future. Uh, the third section uh, is really concerned with the implications. Uh, you know, if we deploy these systems on a large scale, what are the implications for our safety, for our privacy, for our cybersecurity? These are very critically important factors. Last but not least, uh, we are talking about incubation. Um, if we want to avert detrimental climate change, we have to act now. So how can we get these technologies online as soon as possible? And uh, as I said, it's a very complex issue. So we uh, collaborated with top universities around the globe. You can uh, see them here, but that's not all. Uh, we've also uh, interacted with uh, innovative companies and you can see them here. It's really from global player to a small innovative outfit. Uh, to see how they are utilizing digital technologies and artificial intelligence to improve their businesses. Um, and to think tanks and NGO to gauge how the thinking uh, is developing there. And last but not least, uh, we've spoken to governments to see how they can foster and incubate these uh, beneficial technologies so that we can see an impact on climate change very soon. Great. This is the basic outline of the book. Now let's uh, look into specifics. Um, uh, what could we deduct from the compendium? We could definitely detect that um, uh, digital solutions are responsible for many, for, for many virtuous circles, for many positive feedback loops. And uh, as an example, I have pulled out photovoltaic cells here. Um, uh, the industry for zero approach to producing a solar cell has really improved the efficiency, has reduced resource use, and consequently has reduced the embedded carbon and yielded uh, PVCs with an increased efficiency. Now, these better uh, photovoltaic cells uh, allow us to generate more low carbon electricity. And since low carbon electricity or electricity is one of the key impact factors for um, for industry for zero, we have created a positive feedback loop. Yeah, this is not only true for photovoltaics. Let's think about electric mobility. The lower the carbon footprint of the electricity is, the greener the uh, e-mobility becomes in the end. So there are many, many feedback loops. We can't go into them all in detail right now. Do we see this impact already? Uh, absolutely. Let's have a quick look at the levelized cost of energy from uh, photovoltaics. And you can see the green line here. It's not quite an exponential decay, but almost uh, uh, within a decade from 2010, we are below a tenth of the levelized cost of energy. So that's quite an achievement. For comparison in gray, you see the fossil fuel range. And you see that last year we crossed the border uh, between uh, this. So uh, solar power is at the moment the cheapest power there ever was. If we compare that to the forecast by the International Energy Agency from 2010, you can see that we went uh, well beneath it. And we believe that's due to the positive feedback loops that I was just talking about that we're essentially improving processes at many ends and it gives us a positive feedback. This is one specific area. Let's look at uh, more sectors at once. This is our extract of the so-called marginal abatement cost curve popularized by McKinsey uh, roughly 10 years ago, a bit more than 10 years ago. And uh, you have the abatement cost per ton of CO2 in euros on your y-axis and on the x-axis, uh, the abatement potential. Yeah? So this is the original one. I really would like to focus you now on the y-axis and uh, the abatement potential. Because our estimates show that if we add digital technologies to this, we elongate this quite a lot. So we increase the abatement potential of many, many technologies. Yeah? That's probably one of the takeaway messages. However, digital technologies are only a means to an end. If we now add artificial intelligence uh, to the show, then you will see that we increase the abatement potential by more than 
50%. And if we uh, deploy this uh, on, an eco on a global economy, then we have quite enormous savings that we can, we can utilize here. What will be the overall economic impact? Um, here we reproduced uh, a study by PwC and uh, Microsoft, who estimate that over this decade, artificial will add about 7.4% to uh, global economic growth. And that's uh, apart from obviously the cost savings and the emission savings that you can um, utilize within your companies using these digital technologies. And if you would like to know more about the specific cost savings for specific sectors, then I have to refer you to the book. Great. So this is a very quick outline for me concerning the book. I now hand back to Luis, who is going to introduce the interesting panelist of today. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kraft and Professor Indervildi. It's very encouraging to see that these digital technologies are already making an impact. Uh, for those who would like to be notified when the book is released, I'm putting a link in the chat now, um, and you'll be able to sign up using this link to be updated on the book's release date. Great, so I'd now like to introduce our six panelists. Uh, all of our panelists have contributed to the book and are involved in the research, development, or application of digital technologies. So in alphabetical order, we have Dr. Justin Bishop, Justin is an economist in the Business Investor and Advisory Group at Arup, based in the UK. His research involves developing novel, robust, and data-driven solutions to the key challenges of mitigating the climate change and air quality impacts of transport. In his previous role as senior consultant on the transport consulting team, Dr. Bishop's contribution to the book explores how digital twins can reduce the environmental impacts of our transport systems. Next is Mr. Alon Cliff-Tibor, who is a partner at Oliver Wyman, based in Singapore. Mr. Cliff-Tibor is an expert in digital transformation, technology modernization, cyber and information security, and technology risk management. His contribution to the book describes some of the digitalization trends he is seeing in his industry, as well as the potential personal and cybersecurity risks of these new developments. Our next panelist is Dr. Marcus Lader, the General Manager of Water and Wastewater Industries at Siemens in Germany. Dr. Lader is leading the business and digitalization strategy for water and wastewater in Siemens digital industry. And his contribution to the book explores how digital transformation can help to reduce the carbon emissions of the water industry. Next, we have Dr. Uwe Liebelt, who is the president of the European Verbund sites of BASF. Dr. Liebelt is overseeing the transformation of these locations to become carbon neutral, and his contribution to the book discusses some of the ways in which this is being achieved. We're also glad to have Dr. Lim Kiang Wee join us today. Dr. Lim is the executive director at Singapore's National Research Foundation and oversees the academic research portfolio, which includes CREATE. Dr. Lim has kindly written the forward to the book, which discusses how Singapore can continue to flourish by further developing technologies that allow it to decarbonize. Our final panelist is Mr. Paul Routier, who is the Senior Advisor for Innovation at Grow Asia, a platform that brings together business, government, and NGO leaders to tackle challenges related to the agricultural industry. Mr. Routier's contribution to the book considers the role that digitalization may play in agriculture to create more resilient crops and help farmers to be better compensated for their work. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I'd like to ask each of you a question so that you have a chance to tell us about your work before we move to taking questions from the audience. While we're doing this, if anyone watching is an attendee has any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Firstly, I'll start with Dr. Bishop. Your contribution to the Intelligent Decarbonization book focuses on digital twins. Could you perhaps give us a brief explanation of what these are and a couple of examples of how they might help us to reduce our carbon emissions? All right, thank you very much, Louise, and good morning, everyone. 
Um, so the digital twin in the context of transport and the transport system is looking at the spatial separation of where we live, where we work, where we play, where we go to school, and trying to infer the reasons why we make trips between these places. Because it is the separation of these origins and destinations that lock in a certain minimum amount of energy use. And if we're trying to understand the ways in which people respond to decarbonization strategies, having a digital twin of our cities and our communities allows decision makers to test interventions, to test responses of uh, individual citizens, visitors to fiscal and infrastructure changes to allow us then to move to a decarbonized, a decarbonized position. A number of cities around the world, a number of in, in Europe, have looked into the use of digital twins. There's Herrenberg, uh, there's Virtual Zurich, there's a digital twin that was developed for Cambridge. And then beyond that, there are other companies such as Alibaba getting into the, into the sector of creating digital twin tools um, as packages then that can be provided to cities um, to allow them to experience and make these decisions. Great, right. thank you very much, Dr. Bishop. It's good to hear some examples of what we've been talking about. Um, and Mr. Cliftivall, uh, as you know, we're seeing a huge shift from private data centers to cloud providers. Would you like to comment on the implications of that change for the intelligent systems topics that we've been talking about today? And can you perhaps share some of the other trends or concerns that you're seeing amongst your clients here in Singapore? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a good question. I will try to be concise. Uh, the transition from captive and outsourced data centers to cloud providers, specifically to the uh, cloud hyperscalers, uh, is indeed one of the industry's most notable mega trends. Uh, this trend is observed across industries and segments, just for clarity, from technology to industrials, financial services, and all the way to government and the public sector. There is something very compelling about what those uh, providers are offering, and it goes way beyond just economic benefits, purely relying on the providers' uh, a clear economies of scale. Some of those other benefits include uh, massive investment, massive regular investments by the leading hyperscalers into technologies and services that greatly accelerate the client's ability to innovate, to reduce time to launch of an innovation platform, that increase resilience and uh, cybersecurity as well. Um, and, and another point uh, is the rapidly expanding ecosystem of third party developers that take part in the hyperscalers uh, ecosystem, offering services and software solutions that allow clients access to technology enablers that would otherwise not be accessible to, uh, to anyone that is not a huge global leader with uh, very deep pockets. So, so in a way, you could say that uh, hyperscalers are lowering the investment thresholds to innovate. Uh, almost, you could say, democratizing the, the, the innovation process. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they also offer best-in-class engineering, maintenance, uh, monitoring tools and services that, among other benefits, also ensure that uh, early detection of software, service flaws and vulnerabilities, um, security and continu continuity breaches, and environmental impact uh, op optimization as well. Uh, to describe one aspect of this, I mean, when a firm hosts its uh, competing workloads at a higher scale, it uh, undeniably will be ultimately using less computer servers, which means less servers and server components that uh, have to be manufactured, transported, and uh, fed with electricity as well. Uh, a number of examples of uh, what cloud uh, clients can uh, have access to, uh, I'll, I'll just mention a couple. So uh, my Microsoft, one of the hyperscalers, has uh, committed that between 20, year 2020 and 24, it will have invested about a billion dollars into carbon reduction and removal technologies and climate innovation as well. Uh, that commitment uh, is, is, is that its own operations will become carbon negative by 2030, and by 2050, they will uh, have offset the entire historical carbon footprint of, of the company globally. Uh, this is something that, again, if you operate your own data center, is a very, very hard commitment and very uh, difficult target to, to aspire to. Specifically, Microsoft uh, is committed, among other things, to, uh, to deploy digital technology to allow suppliers and customers to reduce their own carbon footprint, which, again, as a client, you'll have access to, to some of those. 
uh, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google, all of them continue to invest in uh, new data center cooling techniques, as we heard from uh, just now uh, from, uh, from Oliver. Uh, they continue to invest in uh, innovative server design, in redesign processes, uh, all aimed to reduce energy consumption at a scale that smaller providers uh, or captive data center operators can't, can't really afford. And uh, we do observe climate innovators making use of, uh, of those benefits already. Uh, you could say not necessarily the most objective one, but an AWS commission study found that uh, in India, moving uh, compute workloads from on-premise data centers to a cloud, to, private, to the public cloud, can uh, improve energy efficiency and reduce carbon footprint by nearly 80% compared to, uh, to, to the captive option. I have one example of a startup company, a Silicon Valley startup company by the name of uh, Autogrid that is relying on AWS services and technologies that are made available for uh, clients off the shelf to develop and offer a suite of uh, AI and advanced analytics based applications that allow utilities, electricity retailers, renewable energy project developers and energy service providers to deliver clean, affordable and reliable, uh, reliable energy. So immediate and virtually unlimited computing power and storage availability, as well as the availability of soft tools, AI, and advanced analytic solutions off the shelf, and other software building blocks as well, can greatly accelerate innovation for small and large organizations. You asked about other trends, so let me just quickly mention that uh, one is clearly the proliferation of data that gets created by the ever-increasing multitude uh, of, uh, of, of connected devices across, across the global networks. And we see firms getting better and smarter about deploying analytic, analytical tools and analytical models on such data collected from IoT and other smart sensors and devices to identify the need to perform preventative maintenance, to identify sources of energy and material wastage, and to continuously improve the design of their own services and, uh, and products. Last but not least is indeed the uh, challenge of uh, information cybersecurity that uh, is, is absolutely a clear trend and a huge concern uh, for firms and organizations uh, worldwide. Organized crime motivated by financial game is investing substantial amounts in building cyber attack capabilities. And uh, unfortunately, governments and uh, state sponsored actors do, do as well. If firms and individuals can't trust the data that is kept by their own providers and partners in safety, uh, then overall, I would say they will be far less likely to engage in digital activities, to uh, embrace digital innovation uh, that are related to those providers and partners, which will inhibit uh, innovation and uh, its potential benefits. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Clifftevel. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to hear that, um, you know, about this democrat democratization of innovation as we get more and more development in the area, and then the risks that come with that. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, now, Dr. Lada, we're seeing an increasing reliance on desalination to produce enough drinkable water. Now, obviously, having supplies of clean water isn't an area where we would like to compromise, um, but the process is hugely energy intensive. So what are your thoughts on how intelligent systems can help to make this more efficient? Yeah, Luis, thank you for the question. I mean, we see in many areas of the world that the population growth is, uh, you know, limited by the availability of water. And by the way, Singapore is also a good example for that, um, where basically there is not enough uh, water sources available, but also other areas in the world. If you think of uh, California or the Gulf region, uh, basically the only way to produce water um, would be by um, seawater desalination through reverse osmosis technology. And this is a highly in energy intensive process because basically you press water through the membrane with 60 bars and digital twin technology uh, optimization technology that we provide is um, able to um, save uh, a lot of energy here um, to optimize those processes in combination with the data available, but also with the automation technology um, is a very important area 
um, to reduce the carbon footprint of the water industry. But there is much more um, on the way to the consumer, especially uh, in, in, um, in the Gulf region, but also other areas of the world, leakages and bursts of pipelines are an, uh, of course, substantial pro problem. So you put a lot of energy into the production of the water, you put a lot of energy in, in pumping the water, and then before it reaches the consumer, it is, it is getting lost through um, leakages. So to, to reduce those leakages is also uh, a major source, a major potential to, um, to save that energy. Of course, also the water as a resource itself um, and to support the development of economies and also of the population and societies. And the third big um, um, area where we see potential in saving energy is the um, treatment of the sewage. It's also a highly energy extensive process. Um, and there are also optimization technologies through uh, digital performance twins. Um, that make make it very easy to uh, to save a substantial amount of energy. In the uh, article in the book that we provide, we show how technology that is already available today, nothing really fancy in the future technology that is available and can be applied today can save ten to sixteen percent of the uh, of the energy uh, that is consumed in the water. Um, industry and the water industry roughly stands for 4%. That's uh, our rough estimation from our literature study, roughly 4% of the global carbon footprint. So it's probably not that big one, but there is a su substantial um, opportunity to save energy and carbon footprint. Thank you very much, Dr. Lada. I've never thought about um, what happens to water as a resource after it's desalinated and the potential for energy saving there as well. So I found that really interesting. Um, now, Dr. Liebelt, BASF has been able to save 6 million tonnes of CO2 emissions each year through linking up its energy and waste streams, which is an incredible effort. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about how you achieved this and how AI or intelligent systems are helping? Yeah, thanks, Louise, and uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, yeah, BSF is running around 250 sites, uh, chemical manufacturing sites around the world. Six of, of those sites uh, we call Verbund sites, um, and uh, this defines highly integrated manufacturing principles. Um, we are energy and uh, CO2 intensive industry. Um, 2019, our emissions were 22 million uh, tons of CO2. And we have a commitment out there to reduce this to zero by 2050. Um, so uh, we're basically running um, three layers to integrate manufacturing. Um, and uh, the 6 million tons that uh, you just mentioned is the delta between a non-integrated and an integrated manufacturing. Now, let me explain how integrated manufacturing works. Uh, this principle has been originally developed in, uh, by our founder, uh, Friedrich Engelhorn in 1870. Um, so it's quite old, and then it has been developed further, 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 and optimized um, over 150 years now. And so the, the basic principle number one, basic layer number one, is the pro product integration. We are trying to reuse each and every waste stream and every byproduct from one process as a raw material for another process. Uh, that can be a direct reuse or it can be a reuse after an initial treatment. At the Ludwigshafen site where I'm sitting right now, which is the largest chemical manufacturing site in the world overall, 88% um, of the waste is reused one way or the other. So that is one pillar of the success. The second pillar is the energy integration. Most chemical processes are exothermic and we are trying to reuse um, the excess energy um, by, by, by putting it into um, a, a huge steam grid, which we're running here um, at those large Verbund sites, these integrated sites. Um, so in, in Ludwigshafen, to give you an idea, uh, we're running 220 plants at one site in a highly integrated uh, network, and we have one steam grid. So that's collecting then all the excess energy and providing it to the next process, which might be in need of the energy. Um, and then the third layer um, is the digital layer, is the data integration layer. Um, digitization and, and artificial intelligence, I can say, has enabled us to optimize 
these older principles of product and energy in, uh, integration over the last five, six years. Um, we have now rolled out hundreds of early warning systems, predictive planning, predictive maintenance. Uh, we have uh, vertically and horizontally integrated our data. Um, we've integrated customers into our value chains. Um, and uh, we have built a digital twin um, of these large, uh, highly integrated manufacturing sites. So for Ludwigshafen, we have a digital twin that, that truly represents um, these 220 manufacturing plant network. And this has enabled us to save um, substantial amounts of CO2 um, by driving lower raw material consumption, by, of course, increasing the process efficiency, and uh, by reducing CO2 um, emissions by lower energy consumption. Um, when I look into the future, I think that artificial intelligence um, will be the key to steering um, the electricity uh, and energy network um, in the world. Because um, when I look at chemical industry, what we have to do is we have to electrify. We have to electrify energy generation. We have to switch from gray to green power. And um, on the other hand, we have to electrify and fundamentally change the way we're manufacturing chemicals. Um, and then we will have, on the one hand side, a demand which is characterized by very high stable base load. And on the other hand, we have will have producers that will produce um, a very fluctuating supply. Yeah? All these green assets, whether we talk about PV or we talk about wind, they are fluctuating. And we have to connect somehow a fluctuating supply and a more or less huge baseload stable demand. Um, of course, storage will play a key role, but I think that artificial intelligence will be, will be needed somehow to organize and steer this, this huge and very complex network that I foresee maybe and will be coming within the next five to 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lever. I find it amazing that um, what you're working on now has been in development for the last 150 years, and it sounds like there's still a lot of um, yeah, room for improvement as AI is integrated into the system as well. Um, now, next we have Dr. Lim. Um, Dr. Lim, Singapore does stand to be badly affected by climate change, including sea level rise, extreme weather, and food insecurity. Um, and although Singapore is responsible for just a small percentage of the world's emissions, there is still a lot of work going into decarbonizing its energy systems. In addition to the work discussed here today, can you highlight for us some areas of research that you're particularly excited about in Singapore regarding the interplay between intelligent systems in these kinds of policy areas? Thank, thank you, Luis. Uh... First, I'd like to begin by congratulating Marcus and Oliver for their initiative in uh, putting together this compendium and assembling this uh, panel of speakers uh, to highlight some of the uh, uh, thoughts and, and, and findings uh, uh, presented in the compendium. I think uh, it's probably true to say that when uh, the National Research Foundation started C40 uh, 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 program at CARES, in 2013, which is like eight, eight years ago now, uh, we, we were still at the very early stage. We certainly didn't have the, the wonderful history that uh, uh, Uwe just outlined, <laughs> outlined for us uh, of the BASF uh, efforts in this. And uh, it's, uh, it's also accurate to say that I suspect in 2013, uh, nobody quite connected all the research in intelligence systems, AI with the, the the, the decarbonization work that has come, that has, uh, uh, come so strongly on stream in, in recent years. So, so I think uh, the fact that we have this panel today and, and, and the competitor of both, I think illustrates how far we have gone. Well, uh, it, it, in 2020, just last year, uh, Singapore pledged to peak our emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 and, and to go to half of that uh, by 2050. And this year, we launched the Singapore Green Plan to advance the uh, national agenda for sustainable development, to mitigate climate change, and then to, and also to promote sustainability through uh, as specific and as uh, concrete, ambitious targets that we can manage 
on a sectoral basis. So it's, it's sort of going down one level of detail in, 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in particular sectors. So, uh, and Luis asked about what our efforts are in energy. So to support these this, uh, uh, goals, uh, we, uh, and I should, I, should, I should pause and say that, uh, uh, we're mindful that uh, in the urban city-state environment in, in Singapore, uh, the constraints that we operate to are somewhat different from that of Ludwig Schiffen or, 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 or bigger countries. Uh, but at the same time, those are opportunities for bringing together you know, streams of thought on intelligence and decarbonization, perhaps in, in novel and, and differentiated ways. So we have resolved that we will certainly continue to support the R&D, uh, particularly for uh, uh, power systems uh, that would help us to develop a, a better energy grid. Uh, uh, and on, on the demand side, uh, uh, efforts to, to research, uh, continue research on building energy efficiency, uh, uh, decarbonization, solar uh, uh, energy, uh, and, and, and to do that through our energy research institutes and programs like uh, C40. Now, if you look at the power sector, we expect to focus a lot of R&D on energy storage systems uh, and the future grid. And this, this, we're not starting from scratch, but we haven't got a huge volume of capability either. Uh, but we certainly recognize that in, in both energy storage systems and the future grid, that uh, the, the capabilities in digitalization and, and, and thinking and working with distributed energy resources uh, will have to be uh, areas that we need to find a, a niche on. And, and so uh, uh, both the R&D and the, and the deployment of, of these resources will, will uh, in, in the context of a very land scarce uh, area. So, you know, we, we, we talk about photo, uh, photovoltaics and, and then the, the first question is, where on earth do we put all those panels? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that much uh, uh, land to do that. Uh, so th those are those are those are uh, critical issues, and and increasingly, I think as somebody mentioned earlier as well, uh, the cyber resilience of our, our systems. Uh, we are, uh, for better or worse, uh, uh, because of where we are and because of the nature of our urban environment, uh, uh, somewhat of a target for 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 a, a lot of uh, uh, cyber attacks, and so. So that's always something that we, we are mindful. Uh, another very exciting area that uh, uh, we are uh, putting resources in is, in, of course, in carbon capture and utilization, as well as in uh, hydrogen, uh, where we want to where we want to understand uh, what the technical and economic feasibility might be, and and to understand the issues of implementation within the the Singapore context. So. Uh, from sort of fairly fundamental work in solid absorption membrane type separations, uh, CO2 to fuse conversion, catalyst development, uh, even CO2 to, uh, to, to aggregate, to create alternative building materials, you know, as, as those of you who live in, in Singapore would know, that it, to, to, to construct buildings, we need building materials which are simply not available in Singapore. So we have to bring sand in from somewhere else, right? So, so, so innovative ideas to, 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 uh, to make use of CO2 as a, as a, as a resource uh, are also being considered. Hydrogen supply technologies as well as hydrogen storage technologies. So these are some, some uh, uh, illustration of some of the decarbonization efforts going on. But besides decarbonization, we have to uh, improve our understanding of the climate science. Uh, this is it help us both in our adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation uh, efforts. Uh, somebody mentioned water supply just now. Clearly, that's a very important uh, issue for us. Uh, how do we uh, adapt to, to sea level rise by mitigating our coastal and, and inland flooding issues? If you've been following the, 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 the press in the last couple of days in Singapore, we had sort of like, you know, like a month's worth of rain in three hours and, 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 and no amount of drainage allows you to get rid of that much water. So, so uh, you can imagine what, what, what happens when you have even more extremes of, uh, of localized weather. Uh, emerging in the future. So climate proofing uh, Singapore for health as well as the 
as the as the built environment. And uh, because we are city state uh, uh, on an island, uh, there is a marine environment around us. So so the, the marine science to go with that is another uh, associated area of uh, of research. So to all these uh, all these areas uh, together, uh, I think. Uh, uh, underlying the, 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 the capability to, to, to address the, the research needed for all these areas, uh, it's, it's really a no-brainer to say intelligent systems uh, will, 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 be, will be a very important uh, contributor and, and uh, enabler for all of that. So I hope that gives you some perspective of, in this area at least, where our priorities might be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lim. It's great to hear about all of the technologies you're investing in um, as well as the fundamental research that you're undertaking into climate and marine science, which of course would work really well together. Um, now we have Mr. Boutier. Um, we know that agriculture is at serious risk from the effects of climate change. Could you tell us about how digital technologies can be used to both mitigate these risks and to reduce the existing environmental impact of agriculture? Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, at the start uh, of the presentation today, looking at those red and blue bars, um, it is it is a very good visualisation of what's happened, isn't it? But it's also a, a very grim picture. And um, many of the panellists have pointed to how their industry is going to change and how new technologies are enabling um, water, transport, uh, chemical production to be more efficient and, and decarbonised. And... Um, for me, uh, the opportunity is around agriculture um, in Southeast Asia and Grow Asia um, is very much purposed around um, enabling farmer families right across Southeast Asia to thrive and to be more profitable. And we're based in Singapore and work across the region. I think the, the exciting opportunity I wanted to share with you is around rice. Um, so rice is responsible for about two and a half percent of the world's carbon emissions. Um, a somewhat surprising figure, I think, and, and similar to the emissions from aviation. Um, and that's because uh, rice in Asia and then elsewhere in the world has typically been grown in a flooded uh, fashion um, underwater. And you'll all be used to traveling around Asia and seeing beautiful rice fields. But um, one of the things that we're really excited about at Grow Asia um, is direct seeded rice. Um, so helping farmers migrate uh, away from flooding their fields um, and flooded fields generate um, anaerobic activity, they generate methane gas, um, and we really do need to move farmers um, over to direct seeded rice. And I guess what's really interesting about doing that is that we can, uh, we can talk about poverty alleviation, we can talk about reducing carbon emission, and we can talk about mitigating the effect of climate change all in the same technology. So when we move to direct seeded rice, we're helping farmers um, use hybrid seeds, Increase, improve their productivity at the same time as reducing carbon emission, as at the same time as helping those farmers deal uh, with the inevitable impacts of climate change, um, particularly rising temperatures and changing pest and disease loads. So um, we're really interested um, in the use of direct seeded rice in, in Southeast Asia. In terms of digitization, what we are finally seeing with digital tools is the opportunity to really change the way we deal with smallholder farmers in Southeast Asia. There are 70 million small family farms in Southeast Asia. And historically, they've been almost impossible to reach. It's impossible, very difficult for banks to make loans. It's very difficult for extension agencies to give information to these farmers. It's very difficult to get information from these farmers about um, how their farms are going. And Digitization is changing all of that. It's really changing the way that companies, NGOs, governments can connect with those farmers. And one of the things that we're really excited about is chat-based technology. So we're really interested uh, in seeing farmers form into chat groups, digital uh, groups on Facebook, on, on, um, on WhatsApp, and really using technologies that feed into those chat groups and help keep farmers informed about technologies like uh, direct seeded rice. Um, we think they are the digital technology that's like to, likely to really change uh, the behaviour of farmers towards these more sustainable technologies. So thanks for allowing me to share that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Boutier. That's yeah, really exciting research and um, looking forward to seeing how it progresses. Cool. So thank you all again for sharing your thoughts with us. 
think we have time for a couple of audience questions. Um, so I've had one come in um, about the example that we had of Google DeepMind and how they're reducing their server calling requirements. Um, so would one of our panelists like to comment on the energy requirements for training such a neural network? Uh, does this energy requirement offset the amount gained from the reduced server calling requirements? Um, and more generally on this topic, is there a set of problems where the training of an AI algorithm will not offset the decarbonisation potential? And how could these be avoided? I'm not sure who wants to pick that one up. Yeah, Oliver, yep. Yeah. I will Thank volunteer. You. So in the book, we also have uh, uh, looked into the energetic cost benefit of this technology. Yeah, And uh, we are very clear that the benefits outweigh the costs by a factor of 10 or 20, depending on, on the example. Also, um, you can use these digital technologies to retrofit existing um, infrastructure and extend the lifetime of this infrastructure and at the same time reduce uh, the carbon, carbon, carbon emissions. So we think it's it's beneficial, A, because it saves more than it uh, actually costs. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, because you, through digital technologies, can optimize old systems uh, and make them uh, future-proof again. And obviously, uh, extending the lifetime of infrastructure also saves you uh, emissions. So while this is absolutely a fair point, we should look into the computational expense and the energy use of digital technologies and artificial intelligence, our research clearly shows that um, the benefits outweigh the costs. Louise, let me just add to this. Sure. Um, this is another example of a virtuous circle. Okay, so one benefit leads to a better technology, which leads to a better machine learning algorithm, which in turn, you know, leads to better. Um, Energetically favorable solution. So, um, but of course, at the moment, it is definitely a concern, but it's definitely in the right way. Yeah. Thank you both for the um, explanation. It's good to know that the benefits are outweighing the risks in this area. Um, so we've got another question, which is relatively general. Um, is a theme of intelligent solutions for carbon footprint optimization? implemented through automation, or is there hope for solutions which still include a labor force? Sure, it's a bit of both, but would anyone like to comment on that more fully? <laughs> Dr. Lada, do you see your unmute? Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, of course, we are trying to take data that are already available uh, we are take, trying to uh, utilize automation technology that is already available and combine both to optimize the process. I'm not quite sure um, uh, where this question comes from. Yeah, I mean, all many activities so far are, of course, heading into uh, optimizing also, of, of course, the labor force. But one of the things that is also very important, and I think that is also something that is driving the um, um, the chemical industry, is you know we have an aging workforce, we have uh, you know we have to qualify new people, and then and the new people that come into the industry are of course um, digital natives that that expect different um, you know automation and different. Um, uh, operation of the plants, yeah. So we are also addressing addressing this point to really make this change in the in the workforce, uh, also towards digitalization. And with this regard, I think it is not really a fight between both things, but it's basically going hand in hand, yeah. And if you see in in many industries, water industry, chemical industry, pharma industry, how many let's say older, ex more experienced people will leave the companies to retirement. That is also a very important uh, shift where digitalization can more help rather than being a threat, yeah. And Louise, if I might, if I might yes, answer sure. almost the, the other side of the, the more general question of where humans and artificial intelligence come together in the context of digital twins of cities, you know, one of the main one of the main sort of characteristics across the examples I gave 
is the issue of uh, openness and transparency and actually using the digital twins to engage with the public through virtual and augmented reality. So it allows, in the case of, um, you know, to test an infrastructure intervention, it allows, you know, people to come in, put a headset on, see what the new structure might look like, see what the new traffic flows might look like, or what, you know, what is being planned, they can walk through the area. And it allows them then to, to, to engage more actively then with the planners who are trying to put in these decarbonization solutions. So, you know, there is the other side of, of digital twins allowing, allowing that richer engagement. Yeah, Louise, uh, maybe mm. I, I can add as well. Please. Um, some some real life numbers. Uh, when, when we started uh, digitization here uh, at BSF uh, six years ago, heavy digitization, uh, let me call it, um, we we in, we discussed this with the uh, the, the works council um, and the union representatives here extensively because there was there was significant fear, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, then we look back at the 70s uh, when we had um, the last industrial revolution, uh, which is which was automation, and uh, we we compared the two waves uh, to each other, and uh, we could see major similarities. And uh, when you look back into the 70s, um, there was no significant loss in the in the absolute number of jobs. Um, there was a replacement, of course, and there were uh, significant changes to the kind of jobs. To the nature of the job, and and the same is happening now. Uh, when we started, um, the num of course you will always have efficiency gains. You, know? you have to increase, you have to compensate inflation each and every year. You have to increase your efficiency. That's I would say the nature of the game um, uh, running running a big company. Um, but uh, if I now draw the balance uh, after six years of of extensive digitization here um, in at BSF. Um, the number of jobs that have been erased by digitization have almost been replaced by new jobs um, that are some one way or the other be driven by digitization. Mm -hmm. um, for example, look at the customer interaction. Um, it has intensified significantly. We, we, there's a totally different uh, kinds of customer interaction now that we have integrated uh, data streams and you need people to run that. Um, so what, what I'm always telling people is qualification is changing. Um, you know, uh, you have to think about what, what will be a job profile 30 years ahead. That's important. Um, and so the jobs that we're, that we're having today will not exist in, in 20, 25 years anymore. But that was always true. So for me, um, this is not a big job killer. Um, it's the opposite. Great, thank you all for your comments on that. Um, yeah, and this discussion does remind me of the prediction that um, by now we'd all be working 10 hour weeks because everything would be automated and we'd have loads of leisure time and clearly that's not the case either. Um, so it's encouraging to hear that um, you also don't think we'll all be out of a job soon. Um, now I realize we've just come up to um, well, 5 p.m. for me. Um, so near the end, but I wonder if we could just have a really brief comment, um, perhaps from Dr. Indivildi or, or Dr. Kraft about maybe a couple of the um, technology barriers that we'll have to overcome um, in order to really implement digitalization um, at its full potential, um, and then we will finish up. So, Marcus, do you want to take this? But I mean, uh, Louise said brief, so it's probably me. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Professor Kraft. Um, I'm, I'm, what, I, what I'd like to say is that I'm, I'm very pleased about the discussion and about the, the variety of topics. It, 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 one, it, it made one thing clear, everything is connected, okay? And, um, so I've been looking into the questions and, and the chat and, and see what some people said. And um, artificial intelligence is not a silver bullet to solve all the problems. But what it does do, it will help us to get across these interconnectivity problems, to connect different areas. Um, because if one thing became clear during the discussion is that it is a very, very complex problem. Um, different fields, different um, 
areas have to be connected agriculture, politics, policies, um, cybersecurity, and, and in all, and what, it, what that basically means is it's all information exchange. It is clear that digitalization will help not only machines to connect to one another, but also us to connect between different institutions because it's not just in the person, it's a whole institution that, that has to be informed. And of course, uh, we heard about the cybersecurity. We've got to be very careful doing it because the moment we, we, we open up these channels, they will be um, vulnerable. And um, so there is a lot of work to do. And um, yeah, Oliver, do you have um, a few words as well? Yes, absolutely. First and foremost, I'd like to again thank all the contributors. Uh, we could already feel in the uh, startup phase of the book that it wasn't really difficult to get high level contributors. You saw there who is who among universities and innovative companies who directly agreed to contribute to the book. There we could already sense that this is uh, a topic that everyone is interested in. We could see that um, uh, digital technologies are a way to improve things with actually a rather limited investment. So people were very keen on discussing it. And uh, I think we have an enormous compendium together that we'll publish soon. And I'm sort of have the feeling that this is a compendium that should be updated maybe every two years yeah, to be at the cutting edge really of things. And again, uh, thanks to everyone who has contributed to the book and everyone who has uh, participated in the webinar. I think we are on the right track here with this uh, work stream. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you both. Um, yeah, we'll wrap up now because we're a bit over time and I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer everyone's questions today. Um, but yeah, check out that link in the chat box and you can sign up for further updates on the book. And hopefully some of your questions will be answered in that. Um, so Professor Kraft, would you like to wrap up? Yes. Um, so Louise, um, the two things I have to do now. First mm -hmm. of all, um, I would like to um, all uh, people who contributed to today's um, uh, panel, um, a special thanks to Dr. Lin, because <laughs> he's been giving us the money okay, to do that. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers and of course all the contributors to the book and finally and last but not least I would like to thank you and Andrew for helping us to putting all these things together and making it work so seamlessly so Louise thank you very much thank you very much Professor Kraft I've really enjoyed this um, yeah, and it was wonderful to hear from all the contributors. So, yeah, thank you all for giving up your time um, this afternoon slash this morning. And, yeah, um, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, guys. See you. Thank, thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.